Okay, hello, good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to the third webinar of the Ateneo de Manila University Department of Sociology and Anthropology Seminar Series on the Web, which we are convening in cooperation with the University for Peace, the Nippon Foundation, and the Asian Peace Builders Scholarship Program. In particular, this webinar is one of the class activities in the course SOCDEV 201.3, Key Concepts and Critical Debates in Social, International, and Transdisciplinary Development. SOCDEV 201.3 is a foundation course in the Master in Transdisciplinary and Social Development, a dual degree program of the Ateneo de Manila University and the University for Peace in Costa Rica. The Master in Transdisciplinary and Social Development is also being offered as a standalone degree program. I'm Zarina Saloma Akpedanu, a professor at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology and the teacher of SOCDEV 201.3. Thank you for joining us in this afternoon's conversations on participatory partnerships for development in Southeast Asia, what works and what does not. We are joined by our graduate students, faculty, as well as the interested public. Please use the chat function on the right side of your screen for questions and comments related to the webinar anytime. Please state your name and affiliation with your questions and comments. We value respect and courtesy the most during our webinar sessions. In today's webinar format, we shall begin with a lecture and which will be followed by an interview to be run like a conversation. And I love to say this over and over again. We are told in our research method classes that we should aim at running narrative interviews like conversations. So we're going to do that today. I could not be more delighted than to introduce our speaker today, Patricia Maria Fernandez. Patricia is a senior development, social development specialist at the World Bank. She was born in Lisbon, Portugal, and educated in London at the London School of Economics, where she, ha uh, she has her Master of Science in Anthropology and Social Development, and at Oxford University, where she received her undergraduate degree in anthropology. At the World Bank, she, she is working primarily in community-driven development operations in the East Asia and Pacific region, and in projects aimed at addressing gender-based violence in the Africa region. Since joining the World Bank through its Young Professionals Program in 2008, she has done an analytical work on participatory approaches to poverty reduction, disaster response, and mental health and socioeconomic empowerment of survivors of sexual violence. She also led mixed methods research teams. I first met Patricia in 2009 when we were doing social impact assessment of Tropical Storm and Doi and Typhoon Pepping. And in 2011, we again worked together. Um, I was then director of the Institute of Philippine Culture and we were doing the data research needs uh, for the Department of Social Welfare Development. We worked together on social impact monitoring of the same urban and peri-urban communities covered in the 2009 study. This is a very rare occasion for social scientists who usually would only have funds and the reason to do one shot, one time case studies. Prior to joining the World Bank, Patricia worked for the United Nations in Kosovo and for the United Nations Children's Fund in Angola and Mozambique. So as you can see, Patricia is a remarkable, very remarkable person. Let me introduce an equally remarkable person, Mary Raselis. Mary is a professorial lecturer at the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, as well as research scientist at the Institute of Philippine Culture. She joined both institutions in 1960 when they were founded by Jesuit anthropologist Frank Lynch. Her teaching and research have focused on urbanization and the empowerment of the urban poor in informal settlements, on children, 
women, gender, reproductive health, and development in terms of social justice and human rights. In 1979, she joined the UNICEF in New York as Global Advisor, Family and Child Welfare, Women's Development, and Community Participation. In 1983, she was appointed UNICEF Regional Director based in Nairobi, Kenya, covering 24 countries of Eastern and South Africa. She remained in that position until 1992, when she came back to the Philippines as the country director of the Ford Foundation, Manila. In 2000, she came back to the Ateneo. She rejoined the IPC and the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Mary works in partnership modes with NGOs, promoting an engaged sociology anthropology with communities enabling them to define and pursue their own research needs and frame, so as to articulate more effectively their rights and perspectives. She always makes sure to say with pride that she has five children, 13 grandchildren, and two grand great-grandchildren. So may I ask you to join me now in welcoming our speaker, Ms. Patricia Fernandez. Thank you so much. So first of all, just thank you so much for, for the fantastic invitation. And it's really a pleasure for me to be able to kind of hang out with you uh, in the morning for me, evening, evening for you, and, and to talk about a subject that I care a lot about. Um, I think what we, um, it's, it, will, it will be a, a chance for me also to, to reconnect with um, Dr. Saloma was saying, you know, with folks that I've, worked with for a long time and that have taught me a lot both in terms of sort of analytical work and, and sort of socially committed research but also a lot about about the Philippines so I'm incredibly um, grateful for the invitation and I hope that you will find this um, useful so the idea of my initial presentation is really to, to frame um, this conversation that we will be having. And I hope that it will be a good kind of kickstart to, to the discussion and that we will have lots of time also both for the, for the conversation with Mary, but also for questions um, from you all that are kind of participating today. So let me get going. Hopefully this technology will collaborate with me and you'll be able to see my screen. Very good. All right. So I think there's, there's really two parts to, to what I wanted to share with you today. And I'm sort of sharing this from, of course, from a, from a professional experience point of view, but also from a personal point of view as, as a development practitioner. So as we talk about approaches to participatory development and to sort of what works and what does, and I think it's important for us to distinguish um, the theory really from, from the practice. And I think one of the most interesting things about sort of practicing development work and linking it with analytics is that we can learn from how things play out in practice and we sort of can move forward and and improve the way we conceptualize and we design um, programs. Um, so I think the core, when we talk about sort of participatory development and why it's an important and kind of extremely relevant um, approach is that what we're trying to do by um, reaching out to beneficiaries of our interventions is that we're trying to find a better fit. So we're trying to adjust um, the programs that we are supporting. And I'm speaking here sort of uh, as somebody who works with the World Bank and also programs that in particular with, with the World Bank that we support, we're trying to sort of find um, a fit with the needs of people. You know? So what is it that's necessary? Is it, are we looking at, is it transport and access? Is it education and health? What are the priorities of the folks that we are, are serving? No? But secondly, there's another important objective here is that we're also trying to open space to create more accountability. No? So can we bring people um, in the center of development, both in terms of uh, serving their needs, but also uh, 
creating a dialogue between them and their governments and their local governments in particular, where they can voice um, additional demands or requirements that are not necessarily those that are directly addressed by our programs. That's an important um, second objective here. You know? um, in the work that we support, again, as, as a development institution, Participatory development um, runs a spectrum you know, from consulting on overall local budgets, from sort of um, consulting on specific um, investment programs, from sort of stronger participatory approaches where we sort of, we give more space to the decision-making power of the communities, all the way to grants that are allocated to local communities that basically have decision-making power over how that money is applied and then in the execution of those projects. What we call community-driven development that is at the sort of um, further end of that spe spectrum where decision-making power of the community is really central. So we're talking about these block grant programs that are then completely run by committees within the communities for the work that the World Bank does tend to be sort of focus on um, political transition um, moments, post-conflict reconstruction and post-disaster recovery globally. No, not to say that that's the case everywhere. There's also um, a lot of room for these, for these kinds of approaches in sort of poor underdeserved areas that can benefit from an, an additional influx of monies that is then programmed in this way. But there's a sense that when certain level of institutions are struggling with performing their functions that community driven development and sort of the community can step into that role. And these are the sort of three um, moments in which that can be particularly um, helpful or particularly relevant. You know? um, the idea with these methodologies is that we are, as we've sort of mentioned already, you know, so we have a service delivery objective, but we also have a sort of um, voice accountability and um, building capacity development. So the idea is that as we allocate monies for communities to program and to implement particular projects, and we're talking about something that is relatively small scale, right? Sort of at the scale that can be managed in a, in a village or a community setting that we're also having a number of other impacts. So we're making resource allocation really transparent. As we're coming into a particular community, it's clear to folks that, that are there sort of what money has been allocated. How is it going to be used? That we're sort of bringing folks together to, to discuss their priorities and sort of um, improve their, their ability for collective action. We are putting local officials in front of communities in a way that generates a dialogue and um, accountability, but we're also building local capacity by providing communities with skills that are sort of managerial skills or sort of the idea that if you are member of a community committee that is employed in building a small bridge in your village that you now become more aware of how to manage financial resources, how to go about sort of checking whether contractors are doing a good job or not to, to demand from governments their sort of counterpart in this process if there are some activities that are required to be performed by local government. And overall, in the design of these programs, the idea is also to improve equity by channeling these additional resources to areas of countries that are further deprived, right? So the idea is that sort of money allocation in general is proportional to um, poverty and population in the work that we develop in this area in, in the World Bank. In East Asia and the Pacific, that might be sort of more relevant to you. So there's a number of these community-driven development projects. They tend to focus um, increasingly on the provision of health and education services. They really also focus on, and that's different from the work that, that 
um, I've been doing more recently, for example, in the, in the Africa region, they really focus on local capacity building. So they have a very strong element of um, imparting skills on the community, allowing communities to fully manage a pretty significant level of resources and to engage closely with their local governments. Another area, sort of an area that's been sort of traditional in this field has been sort of the management of um, common goods. So typically these programs focus very much on small scale infrastructure, small roads, small bridges, small water systems for sort of underprived areas in addition to um, the health and education that's, that's newer. A kind of newer even frontier in this area has been local economic development. So there's been a growing demand from governments in terms of sort of their interaction with, with the World Bank that we help think through solutions that don't focus just on basic infrastructure, but help to generate sort of economic activities. So livelihood interventions, either sort of small scale agriculture or subsistence farming, or um, in a sort of more complex, um, in the, in the rung of, of uh, in, in this ladder, you know, sort of working with agricultural cooperatives to help them federate or working with sort of self-help groups, um, particularly focusing on, on women's self-help groups, again, to sort of help them further, take forward and take further initial economic activities that they have started developing. So these, these areas here are, um, really critical in terms of what we see in, in East Asia and the Pacific. And I would say the evolution in the field has really been moving from small scale infrastructure, management of this infrastructure in terms of roads and water and so on to economic activities and a stronger focus on health and, and education. So what we call human development. Um, again, sort of from, and we'll talk a little bit about that, that later, um, this approach has been, you know, sort of in place, I would say, with the World Bank like, since, since the 90s and something that has been um, growing. And there's been a strong effort to kind of learn from practice on a macro level through rigorous impact evaluation. And, what the, the data has seemed to show us is that um, these approaches tend to have a stronger um, poverty reduction impact and a stronger impact in terms of access to basic services for communities when they're implemented in um, lagging regions and when they complement sort of centrally and nationally driven programs. So the, um, the return to the, the investment in participatory development for the communities themselves in terms of their well-being, if we're measuring it in that way and not necessarily in the voice and accountability side, is that as we go to sort of four areas, we seem to have a stronger impact. Um, similarly, um, governments have tended to turn to these kinds of, of programs in areas that are affected by conflict and violence, and this is globally, this is not sort of a, an East Asia phenomenon, no? but where the capacity of centrally managed programs is, is less. So in the way, in this way, we're sort of like talking about injecting cash directly to communities, but also you see communities taking on part of the role of the state, right, in terms of managing their own, their own needs. Um, and this kind of dynamic between how much is invested in local governments and how much is invest, invested directly in um, local communities is something that is dynamic and depends a lot on the, con the country context and sort of the political environment. In some places, there's a strong kind of devolution. Um, there's a strong kind of devolution of, of resources to um, communities directly. In some cases, governments, local governments hold the strings much more tightly in terms of how much freedom the community has in decision making, how much say so they have on the, um, on the implementation of, of the, on what this money is applied for. 
And then lastly, and I think this is particularly sort of relevant for East Asia, is the use of um, this approach, sort of this community-driven development approach for disaster risk management, so for post-disaster reconstruction, where we really sort of, and the idea there is communities know better and they can do it faster um, so that you avoid having this mismatch between what we think that people need based on sort of these centrally managed needs assessments and what they really need. And the research that Dr. Solomon was referring to earlier on, on Londoy and, and Pepeng really try to look at that and try to understand that better, sort of how well are we doing in terms of meeting the needs of people? Can we surface them quickly enough? And can we respond quickly enough? And sometimes yes, and sometimes no, right? And there are certain things that can only be done by national government, but being able to channel resources quickly through these approaches and letting the, the needs assessment itself be delocalized and communities then have access to money to be able to implement what they think is most important quicker um, has been very successful in general terms. No? Okay, just wanted to, to run you through two examples that are very different in scale to kind of illustrate some of these principles. Um, one of them is from the Philippines. So it's the Kalahi SIDS National Community Driven Development Program. And as you can see, sort of this is a two-step process. It was an initial program implemented by the Department of Social Welfare and Development in the Philippines government with financial support from the World Bank from 2002 to 2014. It started off with a $50 million investment that then was increased. And by the time that we got to the new iteration of this program in 2014, so 2014 to 2020 coming to a close now, we're really looking at a combined um, sort of $1.1 billion program. The idea here was sort of this was initially designed focusing on poor municipalities in the poorest provinces with a strong impact evaluation element. The idea of the program really sort of it had these, these dual objectives that I referred to earlier. It really wanted to reduce, help reduce poverty, help uh, increase access to basic services to these vulnerable and underprived communities. It also wanted to create a stronger relationship between communities and the local governments and sort of make sure to improve actually trust in local governments and sort of the, the, um, the sense that local government was responsible to, to the needs of local communities. That dual objective was really maintained uh, as the program shifted to this sort of smaller, the smaller scope to the larger kind of um, national program that is what you see here. I don't wanna sort of go through, through the basics, no, but really covering a large part of the country focusing on lagging regions, that those dual objectives were really maintained. There were a couple of important changes that sort of, I, I hope will help us think a little bit also through the, the practice bit of our discussion, which, which was trying to um, increase the amount of monies that was going to the poor municipality. So not everybody, not all barangays, not all villages got the same allocation here sort of, it was based on a formula looking at the population and poverty in these areas. So give more to where the, the needs is stronger, uh, but then also review the participatory process that was managed by the Department of Social Welfare and Development. So the idea is that you have government workers in these villages that sort of do help the community to do an initial needs assessment and then run through a pretty detailed process of convening people, forming committees that can think through what are the priorities in those areas and being able to do that well, do that facilitation well, so that you are surfacing common needs and that you're minimizing elite capture and capture by local governments is really key. So there was a lot of attention that was paid in the second phase of the program to how this could be done 
um, in a more structured way, looking at um, the involvement of women in particular, looking at the involvement of vulnerable groups within the community. So there was a series of studies that were done during project preparation that tried to look at how can we create, how can we level the playing field? You know? And there are limitations to that, we'll discuss that later, but how can we create an environment where we're more likely to have um, the needs of vulnerable groups coming up? And that can be done, for example, with sort of a more detailed social analysis at the start, sort of when um, DFWD workers enter these communities, sort of doing a mapping of where are these vulnerable groups, making sure that there's time for their priorities to be discussed. And actually that there are in the scoring system as people are selecting which intervention to use money for, that there are additional points going to um, the priorities chosen by vulnerable groups in the community. So there were a number of, of um, weeks in how this approach has been has been rolled out um, that were significant from sort of the first phase to the second phase. Um, what I would say here is that in terms of government's approach overall, and this was something that was really taken on as part of government's um, strategy, was to use these use this um, approach as a pillar of the poverty reduction and kind of the social welfare strategy together with um, other programs like um, conditional cash transfer that are very extensive also in, in the Philippines. So it was sort of one leg of a much broader approach to sort of social protection um, interventions. Another way that sort of um, to say also sort of as, as part of the World Bank um, support to this area, we do support in East Asia in particular, a number of these kind of national programs that sit very squarely in government's approach. There are very large scale and that sort of focus on lagging regions in other, in other parts of the world, focusing also on fragile and conflict affected regions for the reasons that we mentioned earlier, you know, and they're large and they're well adopted. Another, another kind of um, take on this um, is testing out these participatory approaches for very specific needs. And here, just thinking of um, the disaster response element that we mentioned earlier. And also increasingly in East Asia, there's, there's a focus on what are the most relevant, and most um, helpful strategies to help uh, disaster recovery and community resilience. One of these interventions has been uh, through funding from the Japanese government, about $3 million. So you can see the scale here is very different. You know? In the Philippines, we're talking about a loan to government, so government's own resources um, by a number of different partners, including the World Bank here. We're talking about a grant government to, to government mediated through the World Bank of $3 million. And here it's sort of to, to look specifically at how can we test out approaches to help the urban poor in Bangkok and surrounding areas recover more quickly from disaster. And it's not something that sort of sits outside government programs, but it's building on these very large interventions already implemented by CODI, which is a specific institution in Thailand that has this very interesting arrangement of um, government and civil society in its board and its management. You know? So you have a constituency of the urban poor working with government to look at issues of housing in particular, housing and resettlement. And it's building on the network that this organization has that is, is huge. Can we introduce an element of post-disaster recovery in those programs, focusing specifically on housing for the most vulnerable element of the community? Can we do some qualitative analysis of what works and doesn't work so that we can then sort of distill the elements that have been successful and those can be run through um, by Cody itself and by, by the Thai government in their approaches. And also um, this was a, a mutual learning here and it was a small injection of money to try to sort of bring some value added 
into processes that are already ongoing. So here it's sort of money is not the object. No? So that's not the constraint here. It's not that what's missing is a huge injection of cash to help run a program that was already there. It's can we sort of do this with 3,000, this approach with 3,000 beneficiaries um, and see what tweaks can, can we bring in? No? So I think in this particular case, the key contribution was again, the facilitation process. Um, and it was incredibly challenging to do this in areas where you have significant tensions, where social capital is not as strong as some of, in, let's say, rural village in the Philippines, where we've been implementing these other interventions. There, there, were, there were a lot of sort of community tension issues in these areas, tensions with local government around broader resettlement. So how do you adjust a participatory approach to still have some, some value added? Um, and that was something that was particularly sort of relevant in working with Thai research institutions to do this mixed methods approach, something that we introduced here as well. And that I think um, yielded good results in terms of offering something that's um, on the what works and what doesn't, right? So working on particular adjustments to facilitation worked. It worked more in peri-urban areas it didn't really work in some of the inner city areas because the constraints and the underlying discussions on resettlement were so tough that it was very difficult to then come in and put these band-aids on selecting which are the more vulnerable households in a context of very high vulnerability. So, you know, replicate this part of it in peri-urban areas. Please don't do this again in inner city areas because it just, it just didn't work, right? Um, so I think this... Hopefully, will be a good introduction to the second part, very brief part of the, the presentation, which is participatory development has a number of strong features, right? So, you channel resources directly to vulnerable communities. You can provide an injection of resources and kind of a lifeline to basic services in contexts of post disaster, fragility, and so on. But it's not um, a silver bullet and it doesn't always work as you think it might, no? So being able to be critical about it um, is also very important if you want to make it, make it work. So as a, I think the first, the first part of this is focusing on results, you know, and being a little bit agnostic about what you think is, is working here, being open, right? So um, does it work in terms of poverty reduction? And in, in what cases, right? So I think the data has, has shown us that yes, it can have um, a positive impact in terms of consumption, in terms of assets and expenses, but not everywhere, particularly for poor areas and underserved areas. There is a point at which if you're working in very well established regions, your incremental value starts to diminish. So go where it's most needed, right? Don't apply it as a blanket, as a blanket approach. Um, in terms of service delivery, again, really strong impact and that sort of the interest of focusing on these basic services has been, um, has been driven by this data, you know, that you can really see for deprived areas that you do have an impact in um, access to primary health care in particular. Um, and then something that's important as well for governments is the cost effectiveness of this infrastructure. So we're delivering these services, but always be mindful of what are the alternatives. If we're thinking about, and this is also related to the capacity of communities to, to manage. So if we're looking at a scale of a village, right, you can't ask them to be implemented, like building a highway, right? It has to be adjusted to scale. But what is the, can communities do this work um, in a cost-effective manner? The alternative being local government implementation or national government implementation. And that's another dimension that's important here. Um, so I think there's, there's sort of three thoughts I want to, to leave you with that hopefully will be helpful also for our conversation. No? So it's in terms of the World Bank's mode of operating, governments are always our primary 
interlocutors, right? So we do not work directly or very rarely do we work directly with civil society organizations. So there is, some, there's, there is an incredible advantage to mainstreaming, if we can use that word, participatory approaches in government programs, because you have the opportunity to really help create this dialogue between a constituency and its government and include that in sort of mainstream large scale government programs. So you can move from these small pilots like the Taiwan that we discussed to something that's very large as we do in countries like, um, like the Philippines as we do in places like Myanmar. But that also comes with a particular perspective, right? Government, um, government's own program, government's own areas of focus. So when we're talking about lagging regions, um, some, some regions are lagging by design, right? Or some, some regions are lagging because of political economy issues and we're working within that, that frame. We're not gonna be able to, to change that. You know? So you are always conditioned as you should be, right? As a development institution, you are there to support and provide technical assistance, but within, um, within the frame that's provided by national government. You, you do not have the freedom as a development institution. This is not your constituency. There is a national constituency and there's a discussion between civil society and government. There are certain issues, let's say, like the Thai resettlement debate that was ongoing at the time that we were implementing this pilot that we will not be able to intervene with. That part of making government accountable still has to go its own way with sort of the urban poor movement in Thailand. That's not something that we will have, um, we will be able to intervene on as an external development partner working with government. That's, that's our framing. So that's an important um, element to, to keep in mind. Um, the, third, the second one is really this idea of inclusion. So I think as we're looking at the theory of this participatory approach, I think it can be easy to forget that it's not because we're reducing the scale that we are eliminating the idea of, of an, elite, an elite capture. So we're delocalizing, we're reducing, you're trying to make a particular development intervention more responsive to, um, to an environment and to a population, right? But you should not forget that those same dynamics that you have at national level play out at, at local level. So is, make, is this the community's priority or the mayor's priority? What's the common priority maybe between, between those two dynamics, no? And just sort of, just running a program with a community without a very purposeful sort of effort to mitigate and, and limit elite capture Will not will not work. This has to be really analyzed with strong sort of strong social analysis at the start and real awareness of this to try to minimize it. I would say, sort of, in my experience of watching these programs play out, it's very difficult to reduce this completely. I think you can find good compromise solutions, um, but I think it's sort of the idea that you can work outside of this dynamic is, is, is probably not um, correct. There's something that happens as you are reallocating power and decision making to folks within a community that it will be people that are more educated, that have those skills on the financial management, that are more confident to go out and discuss with contractors, that will sort of be drawn to this, this um, intervention. You know? and, and, and it will be much more challenging. It's important to work with them together and to sort of like open everybody's minds to the fact that there's a stratification in the community and that there are different points of view and priorities. So maybe think about it as starting a conversation, not having this pristine pro process. You know? um, and I, I would say sort of the last most important point for me is sort of um, really being willing to adjust, you know, and sort of going into these approaches with an open mind. So I think some of the work that we've done in particular in, in the Philippines with IPC has been to really look at um, 
what we call process evaluation. So embedding researchers in communities to observe the, the process um, and to, to give us some real time data on, so this is how we would imagine a facilitation process and a prioritization pr process for a particular project would work. You know, we sitting in our offices, as bureaucrats at the World Bank or as sort of you know civil servants in the Department of Social Welfare and Development, we imagined it this way. Community understood it in a completely different way. Um, and what are the adjustments that are needed? And also being able to be a little bit ruthless, you know? And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. And you shouldn't be um, you shouldn't be insisting on something that just because it sort of it seemed like such a great idea, you know, in practice. Um, being able to be flexible and being able and being willing to adjust is is super important. What I would say also uh, as as uh, somebody that has a, a an anthropologist background is there is something very valuable about being able to do this real time. So impact evaluation is fantastic, and some of that data that that I shared with you earlier is really sort of critical. To, to demonstrate that in terms of increasing consumption, sort of reduction in, in um, indebtedness, that these approaches are valuable. But you will find that out maybe three years, four years into a five-year project implementation. By that time, it's gonna to be too late to do course corrections, right? So using qualitative methods to be able to do a little bit of surveillance, community sort of scoping of what's really going on will give you really valuable information to try to adjust. And in particular, on those more sensitive issues of elite capture and community dynamics around the process that you have designed, you know? So I'll stop here. Just thank you very much. Let me stop sharing my screen and um, hope that was helpful and very much looking forward to our discussion. I start. Okay, both of you want me to, uh, shall I start or do you want to say something first? This is Mary. No, Mary, you go ahead. All right, lovely to, to listen to you, Patricia. Uh, let's, let's get started because there are a lot of questions that grow in my mind. Um, and the first is related to the thing we ask our grad students now when they present their thesis, thesis or dissertation. When you did this study, who were you? Where are you coming from, right? And just to introduce what, how, where did I get, how did I get into this? Because I want to ask you, what did you bring into that process? Because you had something before you got there, right? And so let me just say that my own experience there was I had been doing research uh, in an urban poor neighborhood in Manintondo. Uh, let me say, uh, Father Lynch assigned me there because I told him, I have three kids. I cannot go to the province for one month. I mean, you know, so he managed, he found somebody who really wanted some research done in an urban slum area, it was not an informal settlement. And he said, why don't you do that? So I started, of course, mostly people said, you're going to Tondo, it's a very dangerous place, right? No, but anyway, so... All right, so we did research and ethnography. I even published and I began to give talks about that and find it. And then one day the organizers in the Tone de Forcher informal settlement next door, you know, contacted me and said, you know, you're always talking about the urban poor, you know, but we want, we're organizers, we're trying to get them to speak for themselves. Why don't you come and help us work to get them to speak for themselves instead of you representing them all the time. That really shook me, you know? It's like, did I accomplish anything? I mean, it didn't go according to academic standards, right? But okay, so I said, fine, I did that. And let me just, to make a long story short, just seeing how when people get organized with a very well organized, you know, a very effective organiz uh, NGO, um, and there it was the Zonal Antonio organization, uh, that got organized, and you see the, uh, the dynamism when people really know the issues, when they think it through, and when they actually take actions where they see success. These small-scale actions to start to get, you know, 
another 10 faucets into the community when the government doesn't think they should have any because they will be encouraged to stay if you give them anything. That was the orientation at the time. Anyway, so when I shifted into that, okay, listen and so on, and realized that social development and thinking was really happening at grassroots. I had not been aware of that as an academic researcher. And it was then, and I've stayed with NGOs and, and community organizer groups ever since then. It was that, because I would also give talks and so on, that got me finally, somehow UNICEF noticed me and offered me a position in New York. Um, and my background was in sociology and anthropology. So Patricia, what's your background that got you into this with this kind of commitment? Thanks so much, Mary, that's a good question. No, so I think similarly, no, I am an, I'm an anthropologist by, by training. And I, I think that has had a big influence in how I come to development. So I was actually sort of studying in London and I did my, my master's dissertation on violence against women during the civil war in, in Mozambique. And then the war in Angola, and I'm, I'm, I'm Portuguese, so I speak Portuguese, I speak as, as people do in Mozambique and, and Angola, there's a connection there. And the war, the civil war had just finished in Angola. This was 2000, 2002. You know? And I went to, I wanted to do, explore the possibility of doing my PhD research with women that had just sort of been in, in, in Angola. You know? and sort of as troops were being quartered, I thought that this would be an interesting time to go and learn more about, about their lives. Um, so I took a job with UNICEF um, in Angola, writing donor reports for six months, worst, worst job ever. <laughs> and I thought, okay, it will give me a chance to be, to be in country. And I remember distinctly like the, going and doing some live stories on actual measles vaccination and being in a quartering area and having a conversation with, with women there and, um, you know, and I had all this theory in my mind about militarized forms of masculinity and sort of all of these interesting dynamics that I could, you know, get my, my brain around. And then the needs were so basic in this area as I saw them, you know, like I, I realized that what I had in my mind of what would be important and what was really important were so different. And it, it kind of really sort of, there was something that, that sort of turned, turned on for me. And I felt like I would have a more useful life, more, more helpful life if I focus on this, you know, and if I really try to sort of address what's important for people, not what I imagine is, is relevant for them, wouldn't that be a, a neat thing to do? And, and that really sort of shifted my perspective from, from, sort of the idea of doing more academic research to, to development work. And then something that I, I, I brought, I think to my work in, in the World Bank is the idea that you've been in, in, you've been confronted to that early on in your working life, right? That you've been, you've, you have this epiphany early on in your working life where you think, oh gosh, it wasn't really what I thought. There's like a humbling thing that I think is, is important so that you don't, if you go too far without having experienced that, maybe it's easier to disregard that, the, or like to realize that the needs of people and what you imagine that they can be so different. So it's important to ask, right? You know that it's important. Okay, well, that's um, we have a lot of things in common. Let, all right, let me just say, you know, the next thing I want to focus on for both of us is um, once you once you got into the organization, you had a strong anthropology. Really gives you that commitment to talking to people at grassroots level. That's a definite advantage. But you get into a huge bureaucracy, which is really not oriented to that by and large. Certainly, well, maybe now more, partly because of people like maybe you and me. But when I went first into UNICEF, participation was not part of this. No. However, I got recruited to do, well, it was called family child welfare. That was a standard thing. But they wanted to me, me to work on women's women's development, right? And there was this notion that 
you know, UNICEF is mothers and children, and children, I mean, women are always mothers, which is fine. But there was a growing view, this is now, I guess, in what was it, the late 70s, 80s, that women are more than, quote, just mothers. We have to recognize if you want to have a, a better total family system, you have to recognize what else they are, right? So women, we began to talk about first women in income generating, the notion that if they earn their own income and could probably spend it, we know they will spend more on children. Uh, we know that uh, it gives them a certain status uh, and, and, and you know, so they get recognized more by the male side, the whole gender power relationships begin to shift. So women's income generating was uh, useful. And so I think I saw, even though I really wanted also to push very much participation, people's organizing for their voices to speak for themselves. I saw that participation wouldn't work at the beginning, uh, but women's issues did. So I latched on participation and women, right? And let me get into the main areas of the organization, program areas, because because women, anything on women, people were willing to talk about and do. There were many who were interested in pursuing it. And in the process, you put in participation. If women don't participate in, in empowerment, including the men in the community, the community as a whole, you're not going to get very far. It will not be sustained. Any outside support program will not be sustained. So I think that was kind of one strategic way uh, that, that I got it in. The advantage, of course, of being with UNICEF, as you know, since you were in UNICEF, is that it's a social development agency. So you have to look at what is the structure and mandate of the organization, right? Yours is a bank that has certain requirements. UNICEF is a social development uh, humanitarian agency for children, which relies, it's a fund. It doesn't have a budget, right? And it is, their countries allocate funds in their budgets for UNICEF, and then uh, the country offices can develop special projects, which you can kind of peddle to donors who might want to pick it up, right? So the structure is um, the, and that meant that the people who were recruited by and large into the program area were multifaceted, you know, uh, a bit in, the, uh, in that field based groups, very field based, very strong on community side or local situations and we have local national officers who are from the country also on the program. So mix in with international, that makes a big difference uh, in working with government and NGOs. That's another part that UNICEF has much more, uh, you know, could go out and deal with NGOs much more than many of the other or more specialized agencies, let's say. Um, so the structure of the organization, its mandate is really important because then the people who got recruited to it, they were a whole, whole mix of people, right? Including, uh, you know, some social anthropologists, but mainly nutritionists and education people. So it was a very multi-disciplinary uh, group. Uh, and it was kind of problem oriented, not specialized oriented. You didn't want to show, if you had a PhD, please don't mention it because that's not in the status situation. The status is how outgoing are you and able to get government uh, participatory programs. All right. So, um, I wanted to ask you then in, in that light, um, when you joined the bank, was there already a push for participation? Well, if you went there in the 80s, there must have been already something. The women's programs are probably pretty strong already. But how did you push it? And maybe one facet also I want to ask you is, because the banks, in May, you know, is so strong in eco economists, right? By definition, because it's a bank. How did you get past what I saw at the beginning when I used to deal with the World Bank uh, as UNICEF, the, the more narrow-minded economists who had to quantify everything? They might say, yes, yes, that would be nice. You can reach all these people and they organize and you do process documentation. But in the end, you know, what's the outcome? What are your figures? And they always wanted statistics. And we had to show 
that there was more to it. And I know Deepa Narayan, as, as already discussed by Sir, um, Serena, was very instrumental in bringing up qualitative. So how did you, as an anthropologist, um, whom they considered the soft side, right, the man economists, how did you change the inner workings of the bank to orient it toward the participatory processes, which definitely got supported later? That's that's an excellent that's an excellent question, and I think you know in when I joined the bank, I think a lot of that transition to a, a more sort of greater acceptance of the importance of sort of participation and some of these programs had this had already this transition this shift had already been done. I would say by folks that did um, in particular really strong work in in Indonesia. Um, really entrepreneurial people. I think it sort of requires two things. It requires that you understand the organization as you were saying, so know where you are working. I think you're absolutely right that, um, that the, um, there's something about sort of working with like-minded people or in a place where, as, as in UNICEF, you know, where sort of there are, certain, there are certain principles that are not up for discussion in a team of people that have very similar background. I think the, the the, the difference with the bank is that you do have engineers and economists and sort of folks with harder skills in much larger numbers. And some of that discussion is uncomfortable, but it's also an important exercise, you know, to kind of question the principle of, it makes you question sort of some of the basics and sort of need to um, have, as you say, hard data to show. So I would say an important, an important piece of that has really been the quantitative impact evaluations that a lot of the pioneering folks working on this topic kind of brought to the table. I think also the, um, the openness to have um, more sociologists and more anthropologists within the bank, you know, sort of on the macro level, I think that's also something that didn't happen by chance. And I think it happened because of the stark realization of some of the failures of the model in the 80s of what happens on the extreme when you don't do that, right? So I think yeah. there's, there's that kind of shift in, in approach that, that happened that opened this, the, the room to bring on board people with... Um, these, these softer skills and acknowledging the importance of those. And then once you have those folks on board, being able to speak the language of the organization and bring the data. So what does it do for poverty reduction? What does it do for consumption? Is it really effective on, on that front? So that was an important element. And also the stronger focus on, on the part of the bank as a development institution on governance and social accountability. So the idea that change has to come from this, this um, stronger focus on holding governments accountable and that participatory development. And I think that the, the, the change here is it's not an end in itself, it's a means to an end. And is it effective, right? So is it a, is it a tool okay. that has poverty reduction impact? All right, now the next thing I think let's talk about where what is where do you stand in the organization? What are your power, power you know uh, element? What power do you have to influence within? Again, as a personal example, example me. I had been in New York doing this work, we're doing global, very interesting stuff as the advisor, in, as I already said. And the executive director then said, I would like you to go to Africa as the regional director for Eastern and Southern Africa. You will have 24 countries under you. Uh, you are overall supervision. Each country has its own representative and its own staff, but you kind of bring it together. And, uh, you know, and of course, one of my favorite stories, or I said, Mr. Grant, Africa, I, you know, it's really not my area. And he said, you studied anthropology, didn't you? I said, well, yes. He said, well, then you know about culture change and you know about uh, people's behavior and community things and ethnographies. So that's what we need in Africa. So wonderful. What, how, what else did I say? And I said, of course, yes. So there I was. But one of the things I became very aware of, even when I was in New York, that the people who are promoting participation really have to walk the talk. 
So when I come into the country program, the structure of each country office was, was and including the, you had the reps, the regional director, and then above them, New York, and, and the reps had their own staff. So it was so, quite hierarchical, right? And I, I said, you know, we have to make this, the offices have to be more participatory. Uh, you have to have a commitment and understand what that really means, that you consult people, you listen to people. In the end, you're the boss, so you take the responsibility. You have to make the decisions, but you only make them because you've consulted a lot of people so that when you make them, they are with you and they will support you all the way and the program moves much better. That was my conviction. It took me, I would say, four to five years before that really got established in the regional office and in the countries as a whole. Because I said to the reps, you know, you have to do that in your own offices. They, they began to appreciate that I really meant it when I said, look, I'm not going to make any of these decisions that New York is asking about until I consult with you. I have to hear what you have to say. There's so much variation here. And then I'd try and put together and then represent them in New York. But I could do that and they would support me and because of that kind of participatory consultation. So that was kind of my first attempt, participatory management that you have to do it yourself. I even said in New York, actually, I, I became the Global Staff Association chair while I was in New York. So when they were doing some new filing program, I said, have you consulted the filing clerks, you know, the, the poorest, the lowest level file clerks who stand there every day in those days filing papers? If you want to change the filing system, you better talk to the people who do the filing, right? So, so people, in the end, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, but unless you bring that there, and if you, of course, have a little clout because you have a senior position, you can do that. So what I want to ask you, what was your you know, experience in the country offices where maybe they were not so supportive of participation. The government may be more, at least the ones that you connect with, but sometimes it's your own office that's not really all that supportive. Is it? Well, so why don't you check? What about that? No, I think that's a, that's, that's a really great point. I think the bank has a very, as you were saying also, because it is a bank, it has a very different, it has a very different structure. What I've seen in the kind of 10 years that I've, I've been there is a real decentralization shift. So it, moving, first of all, moving people physically to the country office. I think that's been a real shift in, in the bank itself. No? So if I compare it to the structure of, of UNICEF, for example, we, we do have, we're much more sort of Washington based. And that has that has changed considerably. I think also as we move more to becoming kind of like a, what we call a donor of last resort, right? So sort of moving also to more fragile environments and, and to violence and conflict affected places. So having people sit in the country offices may seem a very basic step, but it is an important step so that it's, it's driven from there. Then there's something in the model because these are, you were saying, Mary, so these are not, these are government resources. These are loans or sort of, um, or grants that are sort of very highly subsidized forms of loans. So there's, there's a point at which um, that, that sort of shifts the, the discussion and that this is not something that pro programs are driven by what government, what government priorities are and then there is a negotiation and a discussion about the application of these fundings in terms of its effectiveness right so yeah. it's it's almost it makes it impossible not to listen to in in terms of investment loans what let's say the government of the philippine wants to do it's the government of the philippines money so the government decides whether it wants to contract these loans for for what purposes and then there's an advisory function it's not feasible to come in with a pre-cooked idea and to sort of plonk it um, in a place um, particularly in middle income middle income countries right that sort of are looking at what's the best way to finance their existing priorities and then it becomes it really does become on sort of the, the data and the, the strength of, of um, of the results that you are getting. It's a place that really highly values 
hard information. And that kind of drives most of the discussion about what gets done or doesn't. Okay, well, yeah, I think maybe we should probably uh, give our ch the chance to our students as well as the public to make some comments. L let me just kind of uh, close this little part of it by saying that now that both in principle and in reality, both the World Bank and, and UNICEF and most of the now the ADB, Asian Development Bank and so on, are have participatory requirements. I mean, you, they really hold uh, people for downs, especially on resettlement and so on. Uh, but now we're facing the prospect of bilateral kinds of loans. Uh, and uh, let's say from China, one of the, our worries, I think, in this country is that when you have China funded loans for road construction or the Kaliwa Dam or whatever, uh, as far as we know, they are not that oriented to participatory processes. They want, they're very, you know, get the project done. So that, that's kind of a dilemma. In other words, all international organizations are not the same in terms of how much, how participatory they are. And that will definitely affect how the national government uh, you know, reacts, and of course, then by definition, how the NGOs, how the POs, uh, academics, uh, civil society, how much leeway they have to do this. So let me turn to um, maybe uh, to turn, yeah, to the our participants and give people time to comment or question. Right. Thank you. Hey, at this point, I'll join in the conversation. Um, so in our class, we have been talking about ecological, uh, ecological justice, spatial justice. We have been talking about ecological citizenship, disaster citizenship. And we have a question here that con connects very neatly to our class discussions. Um, I think this is for Patricia. Uh, was there any particular effort from the bank to prevent the reproduction of historically unjust state citizen contracts? So that's, thanks, thanks for that. Let me kind of see if I can think this specifically on um, Indonesia, right? Sort of the idea that we are, yep. So I think two, two parts to that. So the bank has recently done a revision of what it calls its environmental and social, its safeguard policies, you know, that have shifted from a strong focus on resettlement um, and indigenous peoples, particularly on the social side as sort of two core pillars of like all bank funded interventions, uh, participatory or not participatory, right? Even large scale infrastructure had to be very mindful of those issues, make sure that there was sort of just compensation, uh, particularly on, on the resettlement side, including for informal settlers that may not have sort of any guarantees of their rights under national legislation. So those were the two sort of pillars of what we had been working on on the social side. Now we've shifted to um, a different framework after a long process of consultation also with civil society organizations that have really broadened the scope of the social issues that all bank projects have to look at now when we are um, considering financing. And those include things like child labor legislation, also attention to vulnerable groups, including um, LGBTI, you know? So there's a number of additional um, so attention to sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment. That's something that typically we had um, a blind spot on, no? So there's a number of issues that have come to the fore in these consultations that as you are considering an investment needs to be analyzed and then kind of managed and mitigated. Not to say that this is, of course, a, a perfect system um, and that it, it um, eliminates or deals with all, all potential forms of discrimination and imbalance of power that happen in, in investment projects that we finance. But there is a real concerted effort to, to look at, to analyze these issues up front and then to develop very concrete plans that are also financed under these projects to address those issues. And if it's of interest to people, very happy to share the link to, to the, um, the site that has sort of unpacks all of these and sort of unpacks the approach that's taken in case that's interesting. 
You know, um, can I just, just to comment on that, I think it makes a big difference. I think if you, first of all, the bank for a long time anyway, had um, in certain circles was seen as a very negative institution, right? And when you're studying now, like modernity, how did it develop and so on, the, the World Bank was seen by certain sectors as kind of the villain of the piece. So in, in a way, you know, you, you had to deal with that. The difference is with UNICEF, because it's about children, you can do so much. I mean, you don't have to, you don't have that much resistance. Why? Because you're for children, everybody's for children. So, you know, the advantage of being in that kind of thing is something else. I, I'll never forget in Nairobi, my dealing with the World Bank. Uh, um, that is a time of structural limit, right? The bank was being very strong in requiring countries to withdraw social services or reduce social services and so on, right? And UNICEF was there saying, listen, Zambia, they have terrible nutrition rates, but the bank said, no, the nutrition program is very good because at the time they were looking at the averages, which was very high because of the upper class that was doing well. But UNICEF was disaggregating, and we were saying there is a huge nutrition and de deficit problem. Children are dying. And with the reduction of social services, which the World Bank was pushing, government said was forcing us to change, was really undermining children. So I remember speaking to the wife of, well, to the wife of the uh, World Bank director at the time, Peter Eigen, who, uh, who was a public health doctor working in the slums of Nairobi. So she was very strong on the rights of the people. And I said, do you realize what's happening because of structural adjustment in the bank and what the children are dying? The, the World Bank guy or head called me and he said, Mary, what is this? My wife is coming home to, and telling me every night that I'm in an institution that's killing children. And it's because UNICEF said that. And Mary in particular is telling her this. So I had to calm him down and say, of course, I'm not saying that, et cetera. But these are some, even within the UN system, uh, there was a case, because you're a bank, you have certain requirements. And there, at that time, there was a certain orientation to what was right. Uh, and UNICEF was much more, you know, what's happening on the ground uh, with uh, disadvantaged groups, especially children. So it makes a difference how you operate in a situation uh, of how the public sees you and how much leeway you have as a result. Oh, I think that somebody asked a question. I'm not sure that's what they wanted to know. All right, thank you. Uh, we have a question here um, from Lance Espacio. Um, May I inquire on how mainstream community-driven approaches are within the World Bank strategy? In the World Bank's portfolio, how large is the allocation for human development projects versus, for example, infrastructure projects? So I have to be honest and admit that I don't have the latest global figures on that balance. I'm happy to, to share them later. What I would say is that this, this this balance in terms of human development and infrastructure varies quite a bit region by region. So in recent years in the Africa region where I now work, there's been a huge increase on social protection, education and, and health, and sort of a reduction a little bit in terms of the, of the infrastructure, energy sort of transport portfolio. That's not necessarily the same across the different regions. I would imagine you know, that in places like um, East Asia, it, it may be that the infrastructure and sort of hard investments portion of the portfolio remains significantly larger than the human development. No, but again, happy to, to share those um, global figures. I know that we, we have them um, usually kind of di digested out. So happy to share that. In terms of community-driven development, so there's a number of, of programs that are what we call kind of standalone community driven development programs that are implemented either by the social development sector where I sit, but sometimes also by agriculture. So there's a number of agricultural rural water interventions that are also of this nature. And there's a number of social protection interventions again in the Africa region that are also programmed in this manner. And it's becoming, it's, it's a growing 
portfolio. It's still a small part of what the bank does in general. This is not the mainstay of what we do, um, but it, it is um, growing. There's another aspect um, that might be helpful to think through, which is the introduction of participatory approaches, particularly in disaster risk management and urban intervention. So housing and sort of, again, I would say that the focus of projects that are really working in deprived areas like urban slums and so on, tend to have a stronger participatory approach. There's still a very significant part of our, of our portfolio that focuses on financing existing systems. So in lower income countries, for example, no, it's sort of life, life, lifeline financing for basic health or basic education or construction of critical infrastructure. That is a very large part of what we do and that doesn't necessarily include sort of the participatory element to that. Um, similarly, for what we do in budget financing, uh, sort of support to states' budgets, um, again, not necessarily a strong participatory element to that. You know, if I can add, one of the, when you're in an international organization, like the two of us, you, you are working with government. It's UNICEF country program, with, and it's really the government. We had, uh, as I said already, UNICEF had much more leeway to try to work, but even government doesn't usually like for you to fund NGOs directly. All right? Sometimes they will organize it that through them, you can uh, target certain NGOs that work very well with community groups. But to me, this, the, always the challenge was how to get government, national and local, to bring in those voices. And what could you offer as your organization to encourage them to do that? I think UNICEF has been quite successful in number one, bringing children's participation. Usually children are never seen, even though these are children's programs. UNICEF always makes a point, if there is an event, children come and not just to sing and dance, but there's usually a preparatory process with an NGO so that the kids you know what you know can explain their issues well and always impress the adults so you can do things like that or or say you know if you're having a session on um let's say community-based sanitation uh have you brought in the the waste pickers you know the the kids who are uh, waste pickers also uh one of in, interesting just as an example one of my colleague who was a UNICEF rep in, in Africa, Filipino, when he retired, he ran for barangay captain in uh, the Quezon City Boy Scout, the Scout Scout area. And the first thing he did was he, he, he knew, because he lived there, that the garbage was being collected by children, right? And that the policemen were always after them, either get them away or put them in jail temporarily. Right. So what he did was he assembled, as he was a barangay captain, he assembled all the kids and their parents and said, you know, this is what you do. I will try and get the households to organize the garbage so it's not so messy. And I will give you an ID, which you open, and a T-shirt that says that you are a barangay uh, sanitation or something like that worker. And you will get it, you know, you will have your, you decide, huh? we'll have to decide what areas are you but you are legitimized and you, I'm authorizing you to do it. So it, the garbage got collected so beautifully. I mean, it's terrible to think that kids are dealing with garbage. That's another story. But the fact that he legitimized kids who were being, you know, um, attacked because that's what they were doing, at least they were getting some recognition of uh, that they were contributing something and that they were important people and that their voices were being listened to. So that kind of thing, you can negotiate with government. Your programs will not work if you don't have the participation of the people, especially women, my goodness, and children, okay? So it's a, it's a process of getting local and national governments to understand that they have to bring these voices in, okay? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, I have... A question here from a colleague, Nino Leviste. Are, are there instances when platforms established for co-production um, for inclusion, right? 
uh, and, and I would say that it's actually resulting in the obverse. It's actually further reinforcing, reinforcing exclusivity. So community-driven platforms, participatory development platforms, co-production platforms, giving us the opposite, uh, which is exclusivity. Yes, yes, I think that's, I think that's definitely, I think you have to justify, so there, you do have instances where you have um, sort of the use of these approaches to sort of justify, and legitimize something that particular governments, particular local governments have wanted to do all along, right? And in that sort of like a turning the participatory process up on its head or a consultation process up on its head. And I think the ability to, to counter that um, in an externally financed program with a development partner like the World Bank or like, like anybody else is really to have first sort of a clear, um, a, a clear understanding of what the steps are. So what are the steps that you've put in place to make sure that participation is, is genuine and consultation is genuine so that there's a clear understanding between communities and governments of what should be going on and then your ability to monitor right and the idea that as you're implementing these programs you have the same way that we always have technical audits so in large scale community driven development projects we always have sort of 20% of those that infrastructure that will be created will be audited to check whether it's the right concrete it's the right technical specifications so the same way that we do that for infrastructure, having that, and this is the role of these process evaluations and others on the facilitation side, that's just as important. And there is something, there is a kind of um, verification process. So if you are, it doesn't prevent it completely, right? But if you are um, an actor in this process, let's say you're a local development actor and you're sort of like co-opting this, this, this process that you know that you have a fair chance that this will be that this will be checked right um, and that this will be verified that's important in some places there are also kind of significant governance issues with these programs right so this is not um again silver bullet no so the idea that that resources can also that there are cases of, of um, corruption in implementation of programs so making sure that there's clear understanding from the start these are the rules and this is the process that communities have to be able to complain. So in the case of bank projects, all, all projects need to have what we call a grievance redress mechanism. Um, and the idea is that it's a um, number of entry points at several levels where people, if they feel like this, it, this has happened, right? So obviously the community wanted to build a school, but somebody in local government decided that the bridge or the road that passes by their house or by their, that's what really needed to happen, that there's an avenue for a person, anybody in the community to, to, to address a complaint that will be looked into. Um, that also needs to be there as a system. And then making sure that that's good quality and user-friendly and particularly in places where even though that may be happening and I think sort of people may not necessarily want to complain because they don't want to sort of bring in the kind of negative repercussions for their community. It can be done in a safe way or that you can go and ask directly rather than expect people to come to you. All of those are tools. It doesn't eliminate completely, but it helps a lot. All right. Thank you, Patricia. Um, can I just add the, the, the role of NGOs? I do think we have to raise that more because... Um, that there is really, they are the ones who mobilize communities to start with. And over time, the communities themselves get strong enough to know to, to do it themselves. So um, I think it's important to, to find ways. Let me just say that when I returned to things, I was then the, became the head of the And what a change that was, because it's an American-based foundation, but it's quite wealthy, and, but it can work directly with NGOs. And we gave grants to NGOs and the ways you look for the movers and the shakers, you find out what are their programs, you develop the programs with them. And uh, you know that if they work with communities, they're local, so they're, uh, they're at least Filipino based, they will continue with them as long as they did. And it 
and then sporadically when they don't have the time. And what happens is they form networks of uh, people's organizations or farmers associations, which strengthens the capacity at local level for people to speak for themselves and demand of local governments. For example, like we used to have the bottom up budgeting, which was very effective because people could speak. So it's very important, I think, to those processes going. Uh, what, what I would say with the DWD, I would argue all the time uh, before, that you can have community development workers, but, uh, and they can do a lot to under, for people to understand how to work together and what the government can offer, but they can organize to be critical of government. And that is one important function that NGOs and POs play, that they still government, we don't like that, or this is the way it should be, and, uh, and, you know, a community development worker in the government, no matter how well trained they are. I've seen that often. They get stuck in the middle and either they get fired or they resign because they don't know how to fit. So what we suggested is have the community development workers in the government to facilitate the, what government can offer and recognize community organizers on the ground who are NGOs or individually with groups and let them be the development agents who can be critical and raise issues legitimately together with the POs, right? So that dynamic for participation is really crucial. And the international bureaucracies have a hard time with that, right? You can do some uh, with it, but but the direct, um, you know, many of the organizations abroad who provide funds are able to do that directly with NGOs. And even though they're not everywhere, they become very strong force for people's organizations to speak. And that's what sustains development. Even when the funding leaves, if they're organized, they continue on, on their own. Okay, Gopi, that's it. All right, thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you Patricia. Um, at this point, I'm reminded of what Berger and Lukman say about time, uh, the social construction of time. When we are enjoying ourselves, time is very short. Of course, we're not, and it seems we are really enjoying ourselves. It's now 6.27 and we still have a lot to talk about. Um, may I say that we are going to extend for 10, 15 more minutes and those who are interested can stay. Um, if there's a question here, um, just one question about sustainability uh, from Mitch, uh, Mitch Ramirez. She's talking about the Philippines, but I think this is common. Um, observation. Uh, sustainability of programs can quite be a, can be quite a challenge, especially after elections, after where officials who became partners in the program might not be reelected. Um, what has been your experience on on sustainability? And let's it more, let's make it more concrete. What what happened to the NCCDP program in the Philippines, for example? So. Oh. I think that so that's a great question. I think in general, again, talking of talking of systems, no, um, we tend to align in the World Bank our um, intervention, what we fund, with government sort of election cycle. Now, in a number of countries, including in the Philippines, as we're transitioning administrations, there's almost like a moratorium of there's no new things can continue, right? But there's nothing new that really happens in the few months or like the year before as we're moving into a new, unless it's very exceptional and the real, there's a real need. So in this particular case, um, and again, some government uh, election cycles are easier to reconcile with World Bank um, cycles. No? So in this particular case, we had, so I, I was there at the beginning of the development of Kalaki, Kalaki Seeds was there, it was kind of running out, there was a little bit of additional finance to it, there was a, an idea of doing something new, but that kind of waited until elections, right, and it was only after elections that the project sort of got started and there was this massive influx of finance. To be honest with you, I've lost a little bit the thread of, of what was, what is happening right now as the program is drawing to a close, my understanding, and this could be, this could be wrong, no, is that there's a stronger focus on other aspects of the bank program using similar approaches, but looking at conflict affected areas, no, and sort of like fragile areas. And that's been the direction that government has wanted to take 
the collaboration with with the bank now in the Philippines is sort of really focusing on you know, sort of um, areas in Mindanao in particular where there is sort of greater greater instability and greater fragility. Um, sometimes, and I think what typically happens is there is there is learning that goes on on both sides. And also as government is revisiting priorities as administrations shift, it's also the time where the bank typically kind of presents impact evaluation data on things that are working and things that are not working. And there's, um, or sharing of experiences and it's sort of a little bit of a, a stock taking exercise for everybody. Sometimes it can be a real reset, right? So sometimes it can be, okay, this, this is not something with, this, with a particularly new administration that's not, um, specific to the Philippines, I think it happens globally. With this new administration, the priority is education and um, or um, large social protection programs. And then there's a bit of a discussion in terms of the global evidence of um, looking at the situation, the bank may say, we think it would be really important to focus on, on this particular aspect that's been um, not addressed previously, you know, so there's a little bit of a, there's a conversation that happens in these political transition moments. But again, you know, government is in, in the driving seat on these, on these discussions and sustainability is very much dependent on how government perceives these programs and how government thinks that they are helpful or not, right? So the technician's job in this case, or the bureaucrat's job in this case, is to present evidence for informed decision making. Okay, let, let me add a comment on sustainability again. One of the things I discovered after Haiyan, because I went down with some of the NGOs that I work with, uh, and they started organizing the fisher folk, of the, you know, because government was forcing them off and so on. And I, I realized that the ones who are there all the time are the, in that case, the church or the churches, right? And in Mindanao, it's the Muslim group, in the Muslim areas, there are groups there who, who because they are religious or spiritually oriented, that's their job is to care for people. So in, in, in disaster, especially, there they come out. And I realized, you know, as I was in the whole process of that, how do you work out the uh, next development? You know, the nuns there, the social uh, social um, what, action committees, well, they step right in, you know, because they're people of the community, right? And they live there all the time. They don't come in and out like even NGOs who are from Manila or Cebu. And that's when then uh, I began to get into a group who are what they call you know, faith-based groups in development. It's interesting that the secular, you know, the development is kind of a secular business. So they, because of fear that you're not supposed to interfere or favor any particular religion, you have to be neutral. They don't look at the whole social strengths of those community, of those groups, right? And, uh, and just as an example, I was at a Habitat meeting in, in um, Kuala Lumpur, you know, their big one, world one. And so a group of um, faith-based groups, Muslim, Buddhist, and so on, Christian, Protestant, Catholic, uh, came together to make the point that, pay attention, this is a huge sector that you are ignoring because you, you don't want to be religious yourself. But the people are religious in the community, their strengths are, you know, when the when there's a mass in, in Tacloban, when the priest said mass, that was people's hope, you know, and so on and so on. So what I think the point that uh, that Bopi has been making in the class is you ha and and same with Patricia, you have to be flexible, you know, you have to get out of your own same way of thinking, the standard and and look at the reality. What's the evidence? You know, get the evidence. And the second thing is, they would get money like anything because. Filipinos themselves don't uh, government give, but in giving, they would give to the church groups because they're reasonably sure that it's going to not be corrupt and it'll go to the people. And the same thing abroad. The groups give to the church groups because they're pretty sure that they're going to deliver as expected. So let's look at the social realities away from our own narrow perspectives in that particular case. Yeah. That's sustainability. Thank, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Patricia. 
Okay, this question makes me smile. Uh, this is from Toshiki Sakayama. Um, I think the ultimate goal of human development is unemployment, the unemployment of development practitioners, no need for job, such jobs on earth. To do that, he thinks that the national government need to be strengthened in capacity. How does the World Bank and UNICEF approach their counterparts in building their capacity? Do you think the World Bank and international organizations actually undermine the capacity of national governments by recruiting outstanding bureaucrats from national government? Yeah, that's a good sure. question. So I think we do we do sometimes do sort of have have these folks kind of come in and uh, we've had a couple of instances in, in the DRC where I've been working more recently. So yes, um, I think there there is an effort to also um, in through bank interventions, you no know, kind of financing the government services, financing sort of what we call implementation units within government. So embedding project implementation units and trying to reinforce capacities of, of departments that are implementing these programs. So in bank interventions, that's pretty hardwired into um, the projects that we finance. There is an important component of sort of financing salaries, financing, um, training, but also financing other forms of capacity, kind of harder infrastructure, functioning budgets. And that can be really significant, particularly as you work in fragile countries and, and low income countries. So that ability to kind of finance the structure and these projects that I was talking to you about financing education, financing health services have a little to do with that is sort of maintaining lifeline services within the state and the duration of these projects and the budget support that, that the bank also does has that angle to it, kind of capacity and retention of key state functions. And I'll stop here. Yeah, I think, you know, it's sort of fashionable in sort of social discussion circles that uh, NGOs, are, you know, civil society, well, that question, uh, you work, you know, you should work to a situation where they're not needed. Ideally, of course, right? But there, it's a process. It's not like that. You know, it starts with people are maybe not very well organized, or except around their own, say, fishing concerns, farming concerns, and and an NGO or a, a, a cooperative group uh, or leftist group comes in and starts getting people to think, think out of their boxes, and begin to reorganize themselves. All right, if they're successful, if the development workers are successful. The local people organize and begin to understand, begin to take the action. But in our fast changing world, there are so, everything is happening so quickly. They, for example, say if they're in a rural community, they don't have much experience with um, internet, right? Maybe they have cell phones, maybe. But now facing this, education, how are the kids going to go to school if they don't have that? All right, what do they need to know about the internet, access to this kind of technology, uh, et cetera, in order to move into another way, uh, let's say responding to particular new challenges. And that I think is where civil society is. Government is also supposed to keep track, you know, and supposed to be responding, but government is often far behind because they have their own uh, organizational context and fundraising and so on. Whereas the local people, local citizenry, NGOs there, local POs, you know, they, they face the immediate uh, problem and have to solve the consequences, which are getting more and more complicated. So they, so, sir, they solve one set of problems, but then there's another whole set because the world is complex and technologically moving very fast. So I think to say you should work yourself out of a job is not really realistic or even desirable because people themselves want that kind of help. Now it's how you deal with them. If you're one of those awful top-down persons, authoritarian, of course, get out of the way. But if you're really a facilitating to get them to, to understand and to find new ways in which they can make those demands on the system, uh, then uh, you know, that is what happens, right? There's a constant change. It's development workers change their job descriptions, academics change. I mean, if universities 
really believe and engage anthropology, sociology, social sciences, they would have to change their whole structure and be less top down and still in many ways and allow or not allow, enable their faculty who at least want to do that to work heavily in communities and not have to, you know, not think as their major goal in life is to publish an article in some European literature, which is a peer review that nobody will ever read and nobody in the Philippines will ever see. But we want to write in Filipino in ways that local people understand. And that has to be recognized by universities now. It's a different orientation for academics if we really believe in a participatory process. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Patricia. I'm really so sorry to have to play the part of the timekeeper in these conversations. I wish you could go on and on and on, but it's 6.41. Um, so with your permission, I will have to thank you both for, for giving us a glimpse into your biographic navigations against the background of the backdrop of the collective and institutional landscape. Um, Patricia, you highlighted, Mary, you highlighted the radical humility that is needed to adjust to the reality on the ground. My students and I are now in the middle of discussing participatory development, and I am certain that they are appreciative of, uh, to have a glimpse on the work and how community-driven development can deliver its promised co-production of knowledge, co-ownership of benefits, co-creation of capacities amidst Elite capture, which we learned in class, is one of the significant threats to participatory development. Um, I think to emphasize the co-production of knowledge, uh, Patricia mentioned using qualitative methods to adjust project design and implementation. That is the hallmark of the problem-driven development practitioner, which we all need. Now, from your deep knowledge of large development institutions, uh, Patricia of the World Bank and Mary of the UNICEF, we received some hints, some tips on how agency can sometimes triumph over structure, how within large institutions, someone like Mary and Patricia have to find like-minded individuals in all spaces. Uh, both Patricia and Mary have the sensibility and sensitivity of the anthropologist in settings we can only imagine as being dominated by economists. So we were also talking about in, this in class, the, the anthropological contribution to representations of poverty, which brings me to the nature of institutions. And here we are reminded of perhaps Irving Goffman's dramaturgy approach, the backstage and the front stage. We only see and criticize the front stage of the World Bank, of, the, of other large, um, large development institutions. Uh, perhaps even more useful is Peter Berger and Thomas Lukman's construction of social reality, which reminds us that before institutions become intransparent and immutable, the rules, the norms were made by people before us. I, I'd like to emphasize here that, uh, that they are made by people and that at some point in time by us. In the case of Patricia, by people before her, so that a necess the necessary structures were there for an anthropologist and her agenda will thrive. So this is the principle behind each time we say we can change the world. So thank you, Patricia, for spending your early morning Tuesday with us in the middle of your holiday. Um, thank you also, Mary, for being with us today. I am Zerina Saloma Fedonu of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Again, thank you very much for joining us and we hope to see you again in our future activities.